Hi guys and welcome once again to another episode where it's Glenn and I on the same video which is awesome. Today we're going to look at JRPGs with a turn based combat mechanic. These are traditional styles so they won't include things like Fire Emblem Three Houses which is an excellent game, it just doesn't have that traditional turn based JRPG combat. Lovely yeah, we do appreciate by the way that Fire Emblem is turn based but it's more strategic combat than that traditional sense that Mark's talking about. Okay, with that said then, which games make our list? Well, let's find out. Right, I'm going to start with one then. Actually, I'm going to preface it by saying that they don't have to be from a Japanese company. They just have to be inspired by that traditional JRPG style. And with that in mind, the first game then is Bug Fables. Now, this is very heavily inspired by Nintendo's own Paper Mario series most specifically the earlier games, the first one on the N64. And in this game, you take on a team of bugs as you look for the everlasting sapling. Now it has that humor that the first games in the Paper Mario series were very well known for, it has that turn-based combat, albeit it is a bit more interactive in terms of being able to get bonus points for extra hits by pressing the buttons at the correct time. It has a lovely cartoon style, again very reminiscent of those early Paper Mario games, and if you are one of those people that are quite sad at the way the Paper Mario series has gone over the years, this is definitely a game to pick up if you want to reminisce. Yeah, and I think we should um, reserve that title of the Everlasting Sapling for that one guy in the comments that pops up and goes, oh, all Nintendo Switch games are rubbish. There you go, mate. Everlasting Sapling. <laughs> Next up, then, we've got Atelier Riser 2. Is it Atelier or Atelier? I don't know. It doesn't matter. There's about 26 different Atelier games out now, and I believe there's over six on the Switch because they keep releasing their packs, don't they? I think three, six, seven, eight. There's at least eight different Switch games. It might even be nine. There's loads, aren't there? Yeah, I've not played the Riser games. I have played a couple of the other Atelier games. Um, it's very much about alchemy, isn't it? Is that the case with Riser as well? Yeah, it was. I think it was the first game in the series that featured the same main character. So other characters have popped up from time to time, but it was the first one that had that main uh, character in Riser. If you've not played the first one, it is one of those where really you should, because it continues directly. I think it's like two weeks after the first game finishes, and then she sets off on literally a quest for new adventure. Which sounds a bit lame, but it does the job. That's like Cop Out 101, isn't it? <laughs> I'm on a quest for new adventure. <laughs> Never mind. Right, next then, a game that we've reviewed actually very recently. This is Monster Hunter Stories 2. Now, Mark and I are both very big fans of the Monster Hunter series in general. I've been playing it for, well, a good few years now, to be fair. But I didn't play the first Stories game because my 3DS exploded just before it came out. So this new game then, it is turn-based. You have that monster collecting element to it, that kind of Pokemon-esque style of finding eggs and breeding your monsters that you then allocate to your party. What I liked about it is when I first played it, it had like a, a rock, paper, scissors type combat system that seemed like it was going to be very basic, but actually it's a lot more nuanced than you would expect. You have the different weapons of the Monster Hunter series that affect different monsters in different ways, and monsters can become enraged and change their style mid-battle as well. Um, very good game. A couple of performance issues on the Switch, nothing that I would say is majorly important in terms of your enjoyment, and it's, it's one I would pick up for sure. Very good game. Yeah, I'll just throw in on the back of that one, Nino Kuni, which also has a similar collection mechanic it does get very grindy this one to the mid late game but it has that lovely studio ghibli art style a lot of people really enjoy this one and i believe there's a sequel that's coming in september to the switch it's already been out on other platforms next up then we've got chris tales which i recently reviewed on the channel now this has seemed to split reviewers in general between those that absolutely loved the mechanics which includes myself and others that felt that it was actually quite shallow now i would argue that actually the the time mechanic works really well you have the screen split into three sections is one of the few games i've ever played where your side quests directly impact the future so you can see where even if you do a small little side quest that now the town in the future isn't flooded anymore because you managed to help the guy that repairs the town. I've never seen anything like that in a JRPG and I think it's truly unique. Now it does affect the combat in a minor way but again there are a lot of critiques that it doesn't affect it enough and, and again I'd argue that you can actually use it as much or as little as you want and surely that's the best way rather than forcing the player into using this mechanic that they don't enjoy. What did you think of the look of that one? It looked lovely, it had a really nice style to it. I would say that um, the time mechanic that has been done before in games like Chrono Trigger, maybe not to the same extent, but I remember playing Chrono Trigger back in the day for the first time and you could go into the past, like prehistoric times, you could speak to somebody and then years later their descendants would do something differently, do you know what I mean? So that's yeah, I always enjoyed that in that game, it sounds really good. 
Next one then we have uh, Bravely Default 2. Now I haven't played much of this new one, but I have played the first one to completion and I've played Bravely Second to completion too, both on the 3DS. Now I loved the Bravely Default series because of the Bravely Default mechanic, which um, when I first came across it was just incredibly unique. The fact that you could store up moves and wait to hit the enemy with everything you had, or you could risk hitting them early and maybe then have to wait for a few turns and be potentially defeated. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, one of the things that is kind of important about the Bravely Default series is kind of what you told me actually, because originally when I played it, I was just trying to not button mash my way through, but spam my way through the combat, and you can't do that here. It's one of the most nuanced in terms of strategy, isn't it? You really need to have a good strategy. And something else that I've gone back to and previously played and thought, actually, this makes it feel quite different, is using those specific classes. So it's really important, isn't it, that you use the different classes. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously job systems have job been in system. games for ages. I think they're called asterisks in this particular game, aren't they? Um, and you get them by defeating the bosses. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The fact that you can combine them and some of the combinations that you can come up with, you can just build such competent teams and it really is important later in the game. Yeah, definitely. I will say that I do think there's a certain amount of enforced grinding. Because when you're trying to review a game like this, you do inherently try and speed your way through. And there were certain boss fights that were like impossible until I'd gone away and ground, grinded. Ooh, both sound painful. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Next up then, we've got Dragon Quest XI-S, and I will reiterate that this list isn't in order of what we think is best, it's just what's in front of us on this piece of paper. So Dragon Quest XI-S, as you'll know, was previously released on... Was it previously released? Oh, hang on. Yeah, it, was, it previously came out on PlayStation, didn't it? But it was a different version. And then the Nintendo Switch version was like the most advanced, it had more content in it, and the port was incredible. This has then since released on other platforms, so you can now get this version on other platforms. But at the time, essentially it made the Nintendo Switch version Version, the best version in terms of uh, well in terms of feature sets uh, I thought it was very good I must admit I thought when I first played it it was a touch overhyped it's one of those where you're like okay I'm waiting for something incredible to happen but what it really succeeds at is having every aspect of a classic JRPG just done really well so you don't expect to look I don't know it's gonna like change your life it's just gonna do a JRPG as well as that can be done yeah, I think that's the thing. There are only so many times you can reinvent the wheel, aren't there? You know, but what you can do is make sure that wheel works bloody well. <laughs> it's, it's nice and round, I suppose. I don't know. But, and, I, and yeah, this one does that, doesn't it? Okay, next then we're going to put three games in together because they are part of the same series. That is I Am Setsuna, Lost Sphere, and I believe the third one is called Onanaki. I think I'm right saying that right. Um, quite funny coming off the back of Dragon Quest with these because these are incredibly traditional. They don't <laughs> try to reinvent anything at all, but they do do what they do quite well. I wouldn't say they do them as well as other games. I Am Setsuna is the one that I've played the most of, of these three, which was the first. came out very early in the Switch's life. Um, it was actually a, a Switch uh, physical exclusive to Japan or at least Asian regions, and I picked it up that way because it had English on the cartridge, and I very much enjoyed my time with it. It comes from the Tokyo RPG Factory, which I believe is a subsidiary of Square Enix in some capacity, isn't it? And you can definitely see that influence there. Yeah, I must admit, I never liked that name. It makes you think that they're literally just trying to pump them out, yeah. doesn't it? But yeah, same as Glenn, I Am Setsuna was my first one. I thought it was really good. It's quite a sad RPG, um, but I completed that one. I didn't play Lost Sphere, which I know Glenn did, and then I completed Oninaki. Oninaki, uh, it's, again, it carries, this whole trilogy has a kind of morose story. It has a very kind of, it was the opposite of traditional RPG in that sense, isn't it? That they're, it doesn't make you feel great. Yeah, what do you think of Lost Fear? Because I haven't played that one. I enjoyed it. I must admit, I did uh, prefer Setsuna. I just like the setting, the, the snow-based setting. And you are right about all three games. They have that kind of melancholic uh, feel to them, don't they? Which is quite quite unique in some respects. Yeah, good games. I wouldn't say... If you're looking for innovation, you're not going to find it here. If you find them on sale for a decent price, definitely give them a try. Next up, then, we've got the Chemco RPGs. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Glenn? What's up? You all right? Bloody hell, it's like Cookie Cutter 101, isn't it? <laughs> Talking about churning out RPGs a minute ago. Dear I me, mean, it's like 6,000 of these on the Switch now, isn't there? Yeah, all right, maybe they don't make the best list. Next up, we've got the Final Fantasy series. Now, obviously, they've got re-releases of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, X, X2. My word, there's a lot of games, aren't there? All of them are good in their own ways, but there's obviously favourites. I prefer 8, actually, probably over 7, which is a bit of a... Oh, I don't know, that's going to get a few people's backs up, isn't it? I just think it's a massively underrated one that people kind of ignored because they just wanted a sequel to 7, which they didn't get. Have you played any of these? 
See, my experience with uh, Final Fantasy is quite different because I, predominantly, I'm a Nintendo uh, console gamer over the years, so I didn't, when it went to the PlayStation, I didn't play those. I grew up with RPGs like Chrono Trigger that I mentioned earlier, um, and I did play the early Final Fantasy games, Final Fantasy 3 being a, an absolute classic, or 6, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, my, my experience with these, I, I, well, I don't have any experience with these. I did recently buy 7 and 8, the double pack, on the Switch, but I've not played them yet. I will get around to them at some point, but yeah, I'm looking forward to doing so. That's why this works so well as well, isn't it? Because I grew up PlayStation, like all PlayStation. I mean, four discs for Final Fantasy VIII, that was a nightmare until my brother got hold of one of them. But yeah, they're, they're very good games. I think 12 may be the most underrated. I don't know, for whatever reason, it seems to be the one that most people haven't played. Um, the others, yeah, 7, 8, 9 have very similar mechanics. 10, 10 is it 10 or is it X? One went, yeah, you got the 3D ones that I think my brother was hooked on, so I didn't get enough time to play. But yeah, I don't think you can go far wrong, and Square tend to put these down in price on sale quite regularly. So yeah, pick up eight. <clears throat> Okay, next one then, we're going to talk about Octopath Traveler, which at the time it came out was a Switch exclusive, but I believe it's on PC now. So Octopath Traveler had the traditional uh, tropes of the genre, if you like, but it did it in terms of telling many different stories from many different characters as you went along. The art style, I suppose, is the first thing to mention. It had that very unique, was it called 2D? HD, I believe. I think that's what they called it. Looks lovely, really does look fantastic. Yeah, this was a funny one, actually. It kind of whittled out the reviewers that took the time and those that didn't. So there were some people that said, oh, this is, um, it's not great. The stories aren't great, blah, blah, blah. But then you had others that were like, actually, the stories by the end are really good because they all converge and they come together in quite interesting ways. And those were the people that loved it. So it's one that you needed to have put in a lot of time, I think, to get the most out of. And um, they've obviously got their triangle strategy coming up soon that they released the demo of. Mm, that was interesting. I think that was turn-based, tactical turn-based, wasn't it? Okay, next then, one that's quite similar to Octopath Traveler in terms of the uh, the structure of the game, and that's Saga Frontier. Now, this came out a few years ago on the PlayStation and has been obviously re-released again since on the Switch in remastered form. In this game, you take on one of a few different characters that you can choose from, and whilst their stories never interlink completely, they kind of reference each other as you go along, and you can then go back and play as a different character. What was quite interesting about this game is that in terms of the remaster, they've actually added a character back in that was cut from the original game due to time constraints. So that's, I mean, usually that, that's a remaster is kind of met with derision these days because it means not much has been done. But fair play to them for taking the time to really add something worthwhile for this version. I'll be honest, Glenn, you, you, you got me stuck when you said interlink. What film am I thinking of? The new Blade Runner. Do you remember when he has his little test thing? They do that like test on him. He has to keep saying interlinked, oh, yeah. interlinked. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you said it, it's the only time I think I've ever heard it in life <laughs> other than that film. Yeah. Man. One of our earliest JRPG reviews on the channel is Battle Chasers Night War, which I compared recently to The Witcher Thronebreaker. When you're on its open world map area, it's very similar to that game. The problem again with this one, and I don't think it's even a problem, but it, it's a thing, isn't it? Is the grinding late game. Like, it gets excessive late game, and it's very much just there to extend the game length rather than for enjoyment. See, it's funny, that's why I'm going to return to one that we've mentioned already being Bravely Default. That's what made that game, uh, or elevated it for me, because although you did still have to grind, I'm not saying you didn't, but because you could change your team around to such an extent, there were ways of defeating bosses even when it seemed impossible. So that's what I like in a JRPG these days. Um, but you are right, it is just, it is part of the course, isn't it? Yeah, and at this point I'm going to ask a question for a free game, and that is, do you prefer it when you can see the enemies and you choose to avoid them, or do you prefer random battles? What about you, Glenn? See them, 100%. It's, it's not even close. I can't stand random battles. Like, that's one of the tropes of the genre that I'm happy is starting to die out to an extent. I can't, no, I can't stand them. Yeah, it was probably my biggest criticism of Chris Tales. The random combat, why? Oh man, actually just bringing back bad memories, that is. Okay, so we know there are a few others that people would love. Please pop them in the comments because we can't play through every game, but we don't like to talk in great depth about games we haven't put the time into. It's one of the things we kind of built the channel on. So there's one other game that I need to mention, it's Tales of Vesperia. Now, every time I recommend this, it comes from a writer of ours called Jace, who absolutely loved it and put a lot of time into it. But other than that, I can't say much more. Yeah, I just want to give a mention to the Pokemon games. Now, I know that a lot of people didn't like Sword and Shield, and you've got Let's Go, uh, Pikachu and Eevee on the Switch, which again, some people didn't like. What I will say, maybe my perspective's changed slightly, because I've started playing Let's Go Pikachu with my daughter recently, and as much as I can see its flaws, and as much as I can see that that series seriously needs to evolve, funnily enough, you know, with time, 
playing it with your children it, you you do see the enjoyment in their eyes and you do see what maybe you know we saw as children in this series and it's been a lovely experience i'm going to give it a mention for that reason yeah funnily enough exactly the same i've been playing through with uh, my daughter and she loves let's go pikachu it's for, for kids it's perfect so as a kid's pick on the list let's go pikachu and eevee is probably a great choice so that's it for this one. Let us know in the comments your favourites, as we say, and we'll try and rustle up some form of RPG code giveaway so that it's uh, applicable. Lovely. Yeah, as Mark said, we can't mention everything. There's, there's loads. You had uh, Shin Megami Tensei 3, isn't it, that was re-released recently. Like, loads and loads. We can't mention them all. But if it's not on here, the one you like, tell us about it in the comment section. Please do. Right, a quick thank you to our Patreons then, as always, for your continued support, and to each and every one of you for, for watching our videos. For all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers, guys. Glenn's cringing. See ya!